I remember the first time I prayed out loud in church. It was a summer evening at my home church in Versailles, Kentucky, and I must have been around junior high age at the time, and we were gathering uh, with a small group out in the field and some adults, uh, adult leaders, they circled us together to pray. And, And I don't know how this became like a universal church culture thing, but you would uh, hold hands in a circle, and then you would squeeze the hand next to you when it was their turn to pray. And if you didn't want to pray, you could just squeeze their hand and everyone would uh, no longer be embarrassed. And I remember praying out loud that night for the very first time, and I remember how good it felt to do. I remember thinking uh, how much I had grown in my, in my faith. I remember thinking that that wasn't too bad of a prayer for my inexperienced junior high mind. To be honest, some of us would rather eat dirt than pray out loud in front of others. We're, we're just so nervous about saying the right words when we hear others pray with so much elegance. We're nervous about saying the wrong thing and embarrassing ourselves. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at um, prayer in a series called Your Kingdom Come, if you haven't figured that out. It's a series about prayer from Matthew 6 and focusing on what we know as the Lord's Prayer. A prayer that many of us grew up with, uh, if you grew up in around church, a prayer that is prayed at sporting events and funerals, a prayer that has impacted our Christian culture in so many ways. But my hope in this series is just to remove us from any cultural norms. I want us to see something deeper than just, just reciting something we heard. I want us to see something deeper than just praying a special prayer before mealtime or before bedtime. I want us to see something deeper than just building enough courage to pray out loud in a public setting. I want to see what scripture says, because that's that's truly all that matters anyway. Not our church background, but what the Bible says. So the question we'll answer this morning is simply, how do we pray? How do we pray? Before we ever dive into the specifics of what we know as the Lord's Prayer, it's important to ask from the passage, how do we pray? As followers of Christ, how do we pray in a way that's faithful to the Scriptures? So it's going to be in Matthew chapter 6, if you have a Bible. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. If you have notes, all of the main Scripture, uh, and even a little lecture will be on the back there for you this morning, but it's probably fitting that we should pray before we start, so let's pray. So Jesus, he's been teaching all throughout Galilee. People, they've been, ha- they've been sick with diseases and demons and seizures, and they've been healed by Christ. So fame, it's following Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem to Judea, and then beyond the Jordan. Large crowds are pressing in on Jesus, and he decides to remove himself to the mountain. And on this mountain, he sits his disciples down and begins to teach. And just a side note, some of the most influential ministry happens not in large crowds, but on quiet mountains. So do not be discouraged when it's just you and a small group of people listening to the word. We often hear God more clearly when he speaks in quiet moments, not sold out crowds. Influential ministry is taking place. So this is what we see in the beginning of Matthew 5, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and then we land in chapter 6, and there's this, this change in topic. So Jesus, he begins to speak against those that are practicing their righteousness before other people, meaning people were showing off their righteousness to impress others that watched. And that's no different today. We know plenty of Christians that like to parade around their righteousness so everyone can look at them and applaud. We all have this desire at times just to want a public pat on the back when we're doing something good in front of other people. We want people to notice that we're being good Christians. Social media has, has only encouraged that desire. But Jesus, he's going to press against that in the text. He's saying, look, look, if you, if you want to practice righteousness, 
so you can get some public praise, then you'll have no reward from heaven. No reward. You already got your reward from your peers. You wanted earthly praise for righteous living, then you will forfeit heavenly praise from your Father. So he he begins to speak specifically into three areas in chapter 6 that the Jewish people would have struggled with. First, the people were giving to the needy so that others would notice their generosity. Like how much I helped these poor people. Look at me financially blessing those that are in need. Look, look at me. So during this time, there, there, there's no social services. There's no food banks on the corner. There's no snap cards uh, for, the, for us to use at the grocery store. If you were in need, you were dependent upon your family or the financial blessings of individuals. And some people were flaunting their financial generosity so others would notice. So let me just say that East River Park has done a great job of not falling into that trap. I can think of several times when someone has told me, I want to help, but I don't want the recognition for it. And I love that. We have a generous church, and a generous church is a healthy church. Secondly, the people struggled with their prayer life, which is what this entire message is about, so we'll come back to that. And then lastly, the people struggled with fasting in verse 16 of chapter 6. And I won't go into the biblical details of that, but as the people were abstaining from food to focus on prayer, they would walk around with gloomy faces. Wanted everyone to know how hungry they were and how much of a sacrifice to the Lord they were making. So that is the context of this entire series. It's being careful of our motivation and practicing righteousness. So Jesus is trying to teach his disciples the way to live out righteousness before the Lord rather than man's praise. That is the reason he's teaching his disciples to pray in verse 5. How do we pray? With that context in mind, how do we pray? Look at verse 5 with me of chapter 6. It says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. And truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, well, you, you go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. How do we pray? The first answer if you're a note taker is this. How do we pray? Pray in private. Pray in private. How do we pray? We pray in private. So what we see in the text is a warning to not pray like the hypocrites do. So what are the hypocrites doing? Well, the text says that they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and street corners so that everyone might see them. Now, hold on a second. I'm guessing that most of us in this room are not struggling in that area. Most of us in this room wouldn't raise our hands and say, look, I love praying out loud in church. I love, I'm the first one to raise my hand and pray when we're at a restaurant. We've even coming up, we've even came up with games to make sure that you don't pray out loud in a restaurant. I love praying out loud when we're walking downtown. See, the problem today isn't that we love doing this. It's that we think we're supposed to. Let me show you what I mean. I spent over eight years in student ministry. And every fall we participated in this thing called See You at the Pole. I'm young enough to have participated when I was in high school. When I was in high school, we even had like a rally at night with all the local youth groups. And Kalina Azabuki was a speaker. You don't know who he is, but he played for the greatest college sports team in the country, the Kentucky Wildcats. Right, Gordon? Yeah, okay. I'm expecting some boos in the second service. 
Regardless, here's the agenda of See You at the Pole. One Wednesday, once a year, there is a student-led prayer event that happens around the flagpole in front of the school before it starts. But my problem with this event is that it became some sort of courageous tool for evangelism. And I remember attending See You at the Pole thinking I was such a brave Christian to stand in front of my school. And I, re I remember standing around the, the flagpole with just one eye open praying, hoping that my troubled friend might see me as he walked into school and would ask me about Jesus. Just, so just to be transparent, for me, it became about showing off my Christianity rather than a public pleading before the Lord. It became an opportunity for me to show off my righteousness before my friends than a public prayer for those that I love. That's how easy it is to fall into this trap. I had righteous intentions that turned sour by public, selfish, righteous motives. Now, to clarify, it, it, it's not wrong to pray in public or that we shouldn't have see so at the poll. We still were involved with it every year. We pray every week when we gather on Sunday. I prayed publicly before this message. I'll pray when we end this message. We pray out loud in small group. When we gather, corporate prayer is all over the Bible, however, however, public prayer should only be an overflow of your private prayer life. I Meaning there have been times in ministry where I've caught myself praying out loud in front of the church, and it's been probably the first time I've talked to God in a few days. What a dangerous and unhealthy place to be in. So yes, public prayer is necessary, but public prayer is an overflow of our private prayer life. So the goal is private prayer in public, if that makes sense. Let me give you some clarity what I mean by that. So this is point one or a subheading in your notes. Private prayer exposes what we believe. Private prayer exposes what we believe. Possibly, sometimes what we don't believe. Private prayer says that you really believe this all to be true, that you really believe in the gospel, that you really believe there is a God who hears you and responds to you. It is so easy to sit in church and close your eyes when I pray. It's a whole different game to get away by yourself and speak to the Father. That's the ultimate goal of prayer. Get alone with your heavenly Father and pour out your heart to Him. So all throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus in deep prayer. When we see Him in deep prayer, He removes Himself from the chaos. So look at same Gospel, Matthew 14, 23, it says, And after He had dismissed the crowds, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. When the evening came, He was there alone. He went away from the crowds to pray. He was there alone. Let me ask you a real personal question. When's, when's the last time you got alone with God, away from the noise to pray with your father? When was the last time? Was it recent? Was it a few years ago? Was it never? When we were adopting uh, the twins, there was a two-week window where it was a, a big question mark on the process. And um, I found myself in an emotional wreck. And every morning for those two weeks, I would sit on the back porch by myself and pray and just talk to God with all intensity of an honest heart. And it makes me think, why did it take a crisis in my life to move me to private prayer? Honestly, we, we get alone with our Father when we have exhausted all our other options, but this is not the pattern that we see in the Scriptures. Prayer is not a response to a crisis. It's also preparation for crisis that we will face. So Charles Spurgeon, he says, I know of no better thermometer to your spiritual temperature than this, the measure of the intensity of your prayer. 
So if you want to grow in your faith, if you want to know the Father, if you want to be prepared for ministry moments with your family or your friends, get alone with your Father and pray. Pour out your thoughts to Him. Give Him your emotions. Ask Him for wisdom. Confess to Him your failings. And I'm not saying we need to go home and build a little prayer closet like War Room. And if you've not seen that movie, just forget I said that. Um, But what I am saying is that we should know a few places where we can be alone with our Heavenly Father in prayer. And then we should visit those places often. For me, it's my recliner before the kids wake up. It's the bedroom if the kids aren't being that loud. Or it's the sanctuary when no one else is here. Dwayne, one of our elders, he um, told us at our elder meeting on Thursday that he often comes to church at 7 a.m. on Sundays just to think and pray. Find a place where you can be alone with your father in prayer and then visit it often. And so I don't make many promises to you, but I promise you will not regret that. You will not get to the end of your life and think, I wish I spent a little less time in prayer. Private prayer exposes what we really believe, what our motives really are, what our heart really desires. How do we pray? We pray in private. Private prayer exposes what we believe, but look at verse 7. Verse 7 of chapter 6 says, And when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. To heap up empty phrases comes from a Greek word that means to babble. So it's this idea that there were people that prayed in these public settings with long-winded rambling prayers with the intention of sounding good. So when Jesus is speaking about not praying like the Gentiles, it's possible that he means that these Gentiles were pray, praying to pagan gods as if they were casting a long magical spell. Several years ago, we went uh, to Honduras on a missions trip, and on Sunday night, we drove into the city to attend an English-speaking church service that was mainly held for the missionaries in the region. And so there I am with my youth group, some adult leaders, and we're sitting back row, because that's where I would sit if I wasn't the preacher. Um, And this guy gets up to pray, and I could tell, like, we're going to be in this for a long haul. And I don't remember what he was saying, but I do remember that it lasted for roughly 15 minutes. And I got to the point where my students, they're sitting in the row and they're trying not to laugh and they're like looking at me like I had anything to do with it or I could stop it. Now I realize that the length of the prayer was probably just a cultural thing, but the point is that long, elegant prayers are not the mark of a spiritual man or or woman. People can be great with their words and have wicked hearts. The goal is not long, pretty public prayers. The goal is purposeful prayer. Praying with purpose-filled honesty. How do we pray? Secondly, if you're a note taker, here it is. How do we pray? We pray on purpose. On purpose. How do we pray? We pray on purpose. And I've heard this over and over in the church world. That person has such powerful prayers. Why do we say that? Why do we say things like that? We usually say that because that person is a great public speaker and that carries over to their prayer life. But powerful prayers are not powerful because they involve pretty words. Powerful prayers are powerful because we have an awesome God. So again, clarity here in the text and in your notes. Purposeful prayer exposes what we value. Purposeful purposeful prayer exposes what we value. So if you look at verse 7 again, it says, For they, they think that they will be heard for their many words. 
Did you catch what Jesus said? The people valued being heard by other people in their prayers rather than the value of of their heavenly Father hearing their prayers. It's the epitome of living out righteousness for the attention of others rather than the praise of God. So purposeful prayer are prayers that value what God values over what people think, even us. We pray with God's promises and purpose in mind, not our own. Why? quoted this verse a lot the past few months. This is Romans 8.28. It says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. God's purpose is to take all things and work them together for good. All things, all of it, all things. Doesn't mean all things feel good, but all things are working together for good to those called according to his purpose. Meaning, look, I I might value a lot of things in my life, my health, my kids, my job, my future, but I value God's purpose more than anything else. So a purposeful prayer is a prayer that he would finish what he started. Philippians 1 6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We pray sure of this. We pray knowing he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So prayer is not magic. Public prayers don't cast a spell on our situation. Prayer chains don't cast a spell on our mess. Long, elegant prayers don't cast a spell on our lives. Look at the radical reality of verse 8. It's shocking, it's comforting, and uncomfortable at the same time. Verse 8. Do not be like them. For your Father knows. He knows what you need before you ask Him. Before we ever get alone with our Father, before we ever close our eyes, before we ever open our lips, God knows. God knows what you need right now. Even before we bring the request before the Lord, He knows. And if He knows, why are we praying? Like, why even ask if He knows? This isn't a full answer, but I think we'll see it clearly throughout this series. So here's your main point. Prayer aligns our beliefs and our values with God's will. Prayer aligns our beliefs and our values with God's will. As many of you know, we've been praying for weeks for the Johnson family. Baby Eli was born with several health issues, and we prayed as a church. We, we joined so many others to pray. We prayed as elders. We prayed. We pleaded before the Lord. We asked God to do a miracle. We asked God to heal Eli's body. We asked God to do what seemed impossible for us, even the doctors. And on Tuesday, baby Eli, he passed away in the arms of Christ. And I asked the family if I could share a portion of what Eli's mother, Charity, wrote about all of this. It was strong, it was brave, it was the heart of a mother that loves her baby boy, but loves Christ infinitely more. 
she wrote. Now that our sweet Eli is resting with Jesus, I know it makes even myself wonder why God didn't heal him. Everything about this is impossible. But there is one person who makes it bearable, and that's God. He fulfilled his will in Eli. He may have only been on this earth for a little over a month, but I look at this group and I look at the prayer warriors page and see how many fellow believers have come together in prayer, even for a baby and a family they have never met. My prayer is that we all remember the sacrifice of Jesus and never for a second doubt or turn away from God. Even in the struggle, God is there. God has you. God loves you. God has a plan for you. You are his child and you are so loved. So prayer, it aligns our beliefs and our values with, with God's will. Prayer is a submission of what we believe to what the scripture says. Prayer is a submission of what we value to what God values. God's will is not death, but God will take a tragedy and make much of his name through it. Get alone with your father and pray. Make that a part of your routine. Pray with kingdom-minded purpose. Whether your life is, is great right now or whether your life feels crushing right now, pray and know that God is here. That God has you. That God has a plan for you. That you are his child in Christ alone and that you are so loved. Let's pray together.